Our next session is the Green Transition, Unlocking New Business Opportunities and Capital. We've got three speakers, Gabriel Alonso, President and CEO of 547 Energy. Please join me on the stage. Aristos Constantin, Trade Commissioner of the Republic of Cyprus, North America, and Antonius Peppa, CEO of ETME. Ed me. Um, so, um, delighted to have you all, and I'm sure you're going to pick up on stuff that's already been said earlier in the day, and particularly in the energy panel. I hope you all managed to listen in on that one. Uh, so, the format for this session is everybody's got about five minutes to um, present what they think are the main priorities um, uh, for, the, for the green transition. Um, and then we're going to have a Q&A and a conversation. So um, let's start first of all with Gabriel Alonso. Very good. I think I have a, a, a presentation. Yes, have we got the slides? Yep. Yeah, okay, perfect. perfect. Very quickly, who we are, 547 Energy is a global investor in the energy uh, transition space backed by a private equity firm in Houston, we are based in, in, in Houston. Uh, we are active across regions in Europe, in North America, South America, and Asia. We are active across technologies. We are uh, pursuing onshore wind energy projects, offshore wind energy projects, shallow waters, deep waters, floating solar PV, ground mount solar PV storage. And uh, today I would like, in my, during my five minutes, I would like to speak quickly about supply, uh, 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 demand, and leave a last thought. On the, when one looks at solar resource, the, the reality is that, uh, uh, except for the Mediterranean area, Europe doesn't have a really that strong of a solar resource. And the wind resource in Europe is much stronger, uh, both onshore as well as offshore uh, uh, wind, uh, wind resource. And the goals uh, here, especially in the offshore side, have, in, have increased tremendously through 2030. The offshore wind potential in the Mediterranean Sea is really, really vast. And I think it will be very important for people to live uh, uh, today with the concept that, uh, but the, the really strong investment and employment opportunity to be, to be considered. On the supply, on the supply side, two challenges I will identify. One, many times the best resource, whether it's solar or wind, is not close to load centers, which means that we need transmission infrastructure to de de deliver that power. But it's awfully complicated to, to, to uh, consent and to install new transmission infrastructure, whether it's in the Europe, whether it is in North America. The political will is there, but once we, we get closer to ground, it's complicated to get these projects executed. When we think about the energy transition, we're thinking about electric vehicles, more wind energy, more solar energy, and these are technologies, these are technologies that require quite an amount of, of, of mineral resources. If we believe the goals that we are listening to, correct? The, the amount of, the, the increase on demand of mineral resources will be dramatic over the next years to deliver on this growth. And the reality is that some of those key minerals are in the hands of the people that are causing the countries that are causing the crisis that are leading us to react to this. And we need to be mindful that the, this journey of the energy transition is not going to be a smooth uh, journey. And I would like to leave with a, a concept that has been shared today a couple of times about how natural gas is evidently a bridge fuel that is needed to succeed in the energy transition. Correct? Wind and solar are the cleanest, uh, I think the cheapest and the fastest to market sources of new energy, but they are not, they are intermittent, they are not the most reliable ones. We need natural gas to help us bridge the energy transition. Uh, is the most flexible source of energy. And besides thinking about natural gas in security terms, correct, I think it's important that we don't have to sacrifice as our sustainability goals if we think it's strategically about natural gas sourcing. Correct? We, we can find in those countries that share our values uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, political values, those countries actually enjoy uh, the, mo the socially most uh, responsible 
oil and gas. Like so I think it is important that when we look at diversifying the exposure that Europe has had to, towards uh, Russia, that there are actually not only just purely security reasons, sustainability, and I think political alignment should be also elements to, that should drive the decision process. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed. So Aristos, next. Well, uh, we say it's great to see you in person. Last time yeah. we did this was yeah, back online. in 2020 online, yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of which, I couldn't help but um, sort of think back to our conversation mm. uh, uh, back in 2020. And it was at the height of the pandemic. And um, oddly enough, as surprising it may seem, despite the dramatic uh, developments that have taken place since then, uh, I found that a lot of the, the outlook uh, that I expressed then remains relatively valid. And, and um, I mean, look, I mean, let's be realistic, nobody, nobody could have predicted the, 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 the Russia uh, invasion into Ukraine and, and the situation we find ourselves in now. But my point is this, is that the, the war, much as the pandemic did, I think, uh, revealed uh, pre-existing vulnerabilities and uh, added a degree of, of urgency to many um, issues that were, to varying degrees, already in motion. Uh, and I think that's very much true in, when it comes to the green transition. And certainly, um, renewables have, have gotten a, a massive push. I'm sorry, is this not on? Um, so, as I was saying, um, renewables have definitely um, been given a, a push and the, the urgency has accelerated and now it's no longer a question simply of, of climate uh, goals, it is also a question of, of energy security. Um, and so it changes the way we, we look at things. Um, in that respect, um, again going back to, to what I'd said back then, um, the East Med uh, has an important role to play. Whether or not, and I think we've heard that, that uh, natural gas is a bridge fuel and is not going anywhere anytime soon, um, so uh, whether it's in, in, in the East Med's capacity to provide an alternative uh, to Russian gas, uh, or if it is uh, looking at the uh, infrastructure development such as the uh, Eurasia interconnector, which is massively important, um, and hopefully we'll see a, a, a Eurafrica interconnector as well. Um, the importance of the region and the three plus one uh, uh, relationship that we've heard a lot about today uh, remains critically important. Um, another point we, we touched on, I think, was the fragility of, um, of supply chains. And... Um, how there was a need then, there was an urgency then, to diversify supply, to create shorter, uh, smarter supply chains. The, the buzzwords then were nearshoring and, mm -hmm. and uh, reshoring and onshoring. Um, and uh, th that also remains true in the green transition. As, uh, as uh, uh, my fellow panelists here pointed out, the critical minerals, the rare earth minerals that are going to be required are, are, are immense. And, and I said back then, if you recall, you know, the, the European Union needs to look to the Mediterranean, needs to look to Africa. And the, the ambitious goals that we've put in place on the green transition make that even more true today. And uh, I think the, the nascent EU Global Gateway Initiative um, fully recognises that reality and in fact emphasises uh, its uh, pursuit of uh, partnerships with African countries in line with ESG principles um, that provide a viable alternative to China's Belt and Road. And, and the US-led G7 B3W initiative does the same thing. And in this respect, once again, uh, uh, Cyprus, I think, and the East Med in general, can play a pivotal role in, um, in connecting Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And... Um, particularly Cyprus, given its, uh, the fact that it is a European Union member, it is a common law jurisdiction, has exceedingly sophisticated financial services and, and funds industry, I think can play a, a very uh, proactive and, and valuable role in facilitating uh, EU and US investment 
uh, into, into these markets. Great. Thanks very much. Um, Antonius Pepas, over to you. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. So hello and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Antonius Pepas. I'm CEO of uh, a small and medium enterprise company based in, in Greece. It's a quite innovative uh, and disruptive company. So uh, today here, I stand here and I would like to, uh, uh, to call everybody to see the fundamentals of uh, the eastern, the southeastern uh, part of the uh, Mediterranean and also to see the fundamentals on what is happening around us. So the Repower EU, as was mentioned uh, before, and the very recent developments, the yesterday development of the uh, oil embargo uh, of the Russian oil from the European Commission clearly uh, set a new scene, and I think it's, it's, it's a very uh, new situation that we have to take into account into the energy supply uh, chain. And I would suggest that uh, if we read through what is happening, then for five uh, specific reasons, we should uh, heavily invest in the green transition of this area, of this particular area, and I can speak uh, freely of Greece. So the first reason is that we have a proximity to a huge market which is energy thirsty. European Union right now doesn't have many alternatives uh, for energy, so it should take energy from wherever it can, uh, green energy but also non-green energy, but let's focus on, on green energy. And we have this aerial proximity to this huge market because the market is European Union for all these three countries what is, uh, as far as it's concerned of energy. The second is geopolitics. So we are on the right side of the history in a sense in this area, uh, meaning that we have stable uh, regimes and democratic regimes and we have a very strong uh, political witness from the local governments and the local governments are open for business. So this is a, a second part why we should invest in this area. The third one is the source itself. So renewable energy sources are trusted by, uh, are trusted sources by definition because they are your own sources. They exist in your area, in your EZZ or in your land. So you can invest on yourself, you can invest on your own sources and they are trusted sources. And political stability is also providing this trust in these energy sources. The fourth is the funding. And the funding, so no matter what kind of uh, investor you are, since the renewable energy sector in this area is compliant with the E, uh, uh, the uh, environment, uh, and, and the sustainability criteria, both of the United Nations and of the European Commission and the ECG. So uh, I think it's very easy to find sources of funding because you comply, you tick the box of all these uh, goals that they exist. And the fifth element is that they exist very many projects. There is for every uh, risk appetite a project in the area and in particular in Greece, I may say that there are very many projects uh, available for funding and for investing in the area. So having said all that, uh, the final, the final uh, let's say, element I would like to add is that right now, due to the geopolitics and, and the situation, we don't have the luxury of selecting uh, what kind of energy we'll have. We have to have LNG, we have to have green hydrogen when it comes, but this is at least five to... 10 years maybe later on, but there is strong political will for the green hydrogen and we must take this into account, but we must have renewables and we must also solve some of the technological issues that come along with renewables and the balancing mostly of the energy uh, and the stochastic nature of this energy. But I think everybody should take a position in investing in this area in the field of green energy. Great, thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, we, we, we've got about 12 minutes now for um, Q&A and discussion, um, which is great, and several hands. <laughs> so um, I do hope that we can continue some of the discussion from the previous energy session. So let's take, um, well, well, let's take you first, the lady at the back there. So my name is Paola Patelli, and um, I'm currently working as an independent consultant with the um, International Institute for Sustainable Development. On climate change issues, we follow climate change negotiations and the 2030 
agenda negotiations. And I raised this question in a more generic form this morning. Now I'm going to raise it more specifically. But how does the 3 plus 1 initiative plug into global um, objectives, such as the UNFCC Paris Accord, and such as the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals? So um, more, more specific than that is the current situation in the Ukraine has really uh, brought reality and pragmatism in terms of energy security to the fore. Would that warrant, for example, and I'm, this is just a hypothetical question, that countries maybe revise their NDCs um, and the level of ambition that they have? And also with regards to corporate social responsibility, ESG, there's increased scrutiny through the Securities Exchange Commission on companies taking on uh, climate change objectives. And there's a new set of rules that was recently issued by the Securities Exchange Commission in terms of corporate disclosure of their climate change objectives. So um, I'm wondering whether because of the situation in the Ukraine, both corporate entities and government entities could or perhaps should look at their ambitions and goals and maybe check them against reality, the current reality, <laughs> uh, in view of the fact that climate litigation is on the rise and that there's increased scrutiny um, from the political arena and also from uh, the government in terms of the objectives that are taken on by governments and corporations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think a do you want to come back and then I'll bit for everyone in there. Yeah, anybody would like to come back on, on uh, in this question? Yeah. I think, if I may, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, as regards to governmental part, the Repower EU is the answer. So the, the, the goal is uh, to increase the, uh, the renewable energy sources, the, uh, the green uh, transition. So this is very clear uh, in, from the European Union perspective. I think also this goes along with the uh, USA uh, policy and uh, politics right now. So I think on the top level, we, have, uh, we will not go back. We, will not, we don't have a step back. Uh, on the contrary, it is an accelerator of things uh, in both governmental level, but also uh, company level. And I think that companies, uh, because they are very well aware of the importance that these uh, sustainability goals have, they will uh, increase their investment. But uh, I think, Alonso, you can uh, be even more precise on this. No, I mean, I think the, the uh, we, we don't need more goals. I mean, we don't need more ambition. I mm. mean, I think that previous goals were good enough. I mean, if you, I don't think the industry needs more capital. Uh, there is enough capital to build a lot of the wind, whether it's offshore wind, whether it's onshore wind, whether it's solar PV, whether it's even floating PV. Correct? The industry is willing to take incremental uh, technology risk. The issue is that the execution of projects in Europe is becoming extremely complicated for the reasons I explained briefly explained in my uh, presentation. Correct? The licensing processes in some of countries in Europe takes more than a decade to permit. Everybody has an opinion, and everybody's opinion has to be heard. In the U.S., most of the nuclear capacity in the U.S. was executed in 20 years. It was. It happened in the late uh, 60s, 70s, and beginning of the 80s. Why? Because there was a top-down political will that it had to happen. At one point in time, if we believe that energy independence, energy security, and we want it to be from sources within the Euro in Europe, they need to happen. At one point, political, political, uh, politicians will have to take ownership and push forward the agenda. And I'm sorry, some, people, some people's feelings make it hurt in the process. But the overall benefit, the good that, is pers that it needs to be pursued, will be achieved. I think that's the reality. I mean, it just I, from my experience, I've been developing projects in Europe for more than two decades. And it I takes forever now. On the, um, I think the last part that's left, if, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you mentioned, uh, I think you were referencing the DWS issue this morning, the Deutsche Bank issue with the uh, ESG um, reporting. Um, yeah. Uh, in that respect, um, it's a factor. I think um, the, the, there is some uh, um, controversy regarding uh, ESG reporting, and I think there's uh, room for greater clarity on what the benchmarks are, and uh, that will undoubtedly get cleared up by regulators as we go forward. 
Um, I don't foresee that as being an impediment or a, uh, an issue really in the realization of um, uh, either the, the uh, green transition goals or, or energy development projects in, in general. Question, though. I'd like to have your, your view on this because I often tell people we're not having an energy crisis. We're having two energy crises. We're having an energy cost crisis that started actually quite a while back. And then we have a, an energy security crisis, which of course, to a large extent, has developed because of Russia's aggression. Uh, but we also have a third crisis around the corner, which is the commodity crisis. Because as you pointed out, uh, electric vehicles, fantastic. They require about eight times the minerals of a conventional uh, car. Wind energy, I am a very strong supporter of wind energy, but in order to generate the same load as, as the CCGT, you're going to need about 16 times the mineral input. And of course, as you pointed out, these minerals are not fine in the easiest of places. Now, we're already suffering from a dependency that our partners uh, effectively have weaponized. We are in the future looking at dependencies on other geographies, which are also complex. How do we learn from our, I'm not saying mistakes, but I'm saying our experiences today to actually put in place the mechanisms so that we are not jeopardizing the transition that we're all backing by five years from now finding ourselves having moved away from the energy crisis but right into a commodity crisis? Thanks. Um, any final questions from the, from the floor? Yes, gentlemen here. Yeah, so uh, just kind of going back to, to a question that I, that I raised earlier, which is dealing with sort of the urgency of the situation. And this is something that it doesn't seem to me there's much clarity in this, uh, you know, thinking about what politicians are saying in Europe. Um, the expectation is that we're going to see about 40 to 50 percent increase in demand for energy over the next 25 years. Totally agree some of that will come from green, some of that will come from natural gas, etc. But with your point that it takes 10 years, 20 years for projects in Europe, are Europeans doing enough to get ready for the increase and, and for the competition that they will have for commodities? whether they be natural gas or otherwise, et cetera. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. So who wants to respond? To we can the take a stab, and then we can we'll show we're all dead. Yeah, yeah. So on the critical minerals and the rare earth minerals, you're absolutely right. And I wouldn't say it's coming. I'd say it's here. Um, that's the reality. Um, and, and, and Gabriel can probably give you more specific uh, examples. But as, as I mentioned, there are initiatives to try and address this whether or not um, they can and, and will be successful in time to, to uh, alleviate uh, the issue uh, remains to be seen. Um, and, you know, sort of combining the two questions, um, in the short term, this, as you quite rightly said, we're, not looking, we're looking at this in, in, in time. There's the short term, there's medium term, and there's long term. In the short term, there is a lot of pain. That's just how it is, right? There's a, there already is, and there will be more. Uh, you know, to coin a phrase, winter is coming. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's uh, likely going to get worse. I mean, uh, Europe is, uh, the long contracts are going to Asia. Uh, there's over-reliance on spot. Prices are going to go up. Energy prices go up. Everything goes up. People suffer. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that I'm wrong. But that's what the, the, it looks like right now, at least in the short term, unless something changes dramatically. Um, that's my two cents. I would say that um, the, the, I think the answer could take for, forever, to be frank. But uh, on the commodity crisis, uh, quick comment is that we need to be mindful that mining as an industry moves at glacial pace. Right. I mean, pretending that we can start mining and something will happen in the next week, the next year, or the next five years is going to be complicated. However, I mean, we need to move now, correct? There are multiple fronts where the industry has to work because an energy transition like the one we all envision and we all want, it doesn't happen 
under the old structures. It, you need to change several structures. Thanks. For, for the last part, which is quite important, the licensing. Uh, I'm more optimistic because also in the Repower EU, it is mentioned that the licensing has to uh, become uh, less of a factor of a problem. And I think, uh, because I have been discussing with many people in, in Brussels and in, in many uh, also in, in Greece, that everybody understands that right now we have to scale down the time that we need to license. But uh, apart from that, energy projects, no matter what kind of energy source it is, they take time. It's the nature of the energy industry that it has long lead times. But generally speaking, I think the renewables will be faster than any other uh, energy substitutes of our current luck. Said to me, okay. A friend recently said to me, climate change is, is as much about change as it is about climate. Um, it's about changing the way we do things. Uh, th these things take time. This is not going to be a 180 pivot that's going to happen overnight. And somebody said in the early, earlier panel, actually, that uh, nobody disagrees about the end goals. We can you know, debate how we're going to get there and what's the, you know, the best uh, method for getting there. But we have wind we have solar, and we have gas as a transitional uh, fuel. Um, and I think, um, you know, what was said this morning, I, I can't remember who said it. I, actually, it was probably David Harris, because he, um, you know, has had a good turn of, of, of phrase, and he said, the pragmatists have now got to take charge uh, over the purists, and I think that's the kind of discussion that we've had today, mm -hmm. a more nuanced discussion about um, the green transition and, and how we're going to reach these targets. So thank you very much, everybody who's contributed through your questions and, and your um, introductions to, to that discussion. Um, thanks to the panel.